Chances are you stream your favorite shows or movies, and the market for that is about to get even more saturated. Consumers will say, you know what, I'm going to watch this one here for these programs, I'm going to turn it off, and then I'm going to move to this one. A JP Morgan media analyst breaks down the potential impact. What's the future of capitalism? Chairman and CEO Jamie Dimon weighs in. Plus, it's hard to imagine this bank without a single computer. I'll take you back to 1959 when a JP Morgan Chase predecessor took a big step towards automation. Welcome to JP Morgan Chase News. I'm Jason Lobo reporting from London. This year, we'll see the release of several new streaming services from companies including NBC and HBO, adding to an already crowded field with big names like Netflix and Disney. To dive into what this could mean for the industry, let's send it over to Nick Parker. With a multitude of streaming offerings, 2020 has been dubbed by JP Morgan Research the year of churn for streaming, reflecting a new trend in consumer behavior. And for a look at the possible impact and effect on cinema attendance, we have JP Morgan's senior analyst for US media equity research, Alexia Quajani, joining me. Alexia, thank you very much. Great Thanks to have you. Thanks for having me. What is the dynamic behind the year of churn? What we're seeing is just the proliferation of so many new streaming services. I think someone told me recently there's over 300 of them right now and growing. So it's just not really sustainable to have so many of these, uh, these different streaming services. I think by the back half of 2020, you'll see a lot of churn because consumers will say, you know what, I'm going to watch this, this one here for these programs, I'm going to turn it off, and then I'm going to move to this one. So with consumers subscribing to and then canceling memberships, are these services actually going to be profitable? I think profitability really isn't a focus right now with investors, simply because most of them aren't profitable, so it's not an expectation. I think the bigger uh, companies that we find directly have put out targets saying by this period we'll have X number of subscribers and at that point we'll be break even or, or be profitable. And if the competition continues to intensify, which clearly I think it's on that path, we may see them choose to pick up that content spend. And I think at that point investors will take another look and say, wait a second, when are you going to be profitable and how much money are you pouring into this? So on that note about business models, what is the rationale between creating your own streaming service versus licensing it to another streamer? Well, you have different approaches to this. You have dealers which are saying, I don't have the IP or the scale. And those are choosing, saying, you know what, I'm going to take my content, I'm going to sell it to the highest bidder. And then there's those that are saying, you know what, this is this is my future. I've got a lot of IP, I've got a lot of scale, I'm going to jump into this you know, with two feet. And those are taking their content off of all the other platforms and putting it directly on their, on their platform, and they're going for it. And finally, what kind of impact is this having on the cinema attendance from your point of view? I think there's been a misconception that um, this proliferation of streamers is killing the movie theater. I, I really do think that's a bit extreme. You know, there's been 12 record box office years since the year 2000, and a couple of those have been recently. 2018, for example, was a box office record. Now, having said that, you know, there is some impact. I think you're seeing a lot of the mid-sized films not being made for the theaters anymore, and a shift toward bigger franchise films where you really feel it's the experience to go to the movie theater to watch it. It's only a fascinating climate. Alexia, thank you so much for joining us. Of course, anytime. Capitalism may be at a tipping point, according to J.P. Morgan Chase's Jamie Dimon, the chairman and CEO opining for Time Magazine's Davos 2020 issue, which was produced in partnership with the World Economic Forum. Dimon writes, Capitalism must be modified to do a better job of creating a healthier society. He explains, That means meaningful changes like rebuilding our education system and providing skills training, affordable health care policies, substantial infrastructure investment, and sensible immigration reform and climate policies. That's just a start. Diamond touted the firm's $200 million investment in Detroit, Michigan, which helped create jobs, small businesses, and affordable housing, calling it a win-win for both the people of Detroit and for J.P. Morgan Chase. Today, you can hold a computer in the palm of your hand. Now imagine one taking up an entire room of an office building. 61 years ago this month, J.P. Morgan Chase predecessor Chase Manhattan Bank installed its first computer, the IBM 650 Data Processing Center. The goal was to increase the efficiency of data processing while computing employee payroll and benefits. This new machine had the ability to calculate equations at extraordinary speed, but humans needed to carefully program the computer to do its job. After 11 years of service, Chase Manhattan Bank retired the IBM 650, paving the way for the next innovation in automation and saving square feet in the process. 
That wraps up this week's J.P. Morgan Chase News. I'm Jason Lobo. We'll see you next week. Thank you.